So I, I originally wrote this talk because people were saying, well, you've told me how to use in, in individual MPI functions, but you've not told me how to write a real code. But in some senses, that's an impossible task. I mean, I've given you an exemplar application, the case study, but you know, it's like you've been on a three-day course, I and mean, you could cover all the syntax of C in an afternoon. It's only about five keywords, int, real, no, float, for, struct, what else? And then how do I write a real C program? Well, because it's completely dependent on what you want to do. So this is actually more about how you debug programs, but it's just general comments about MPI codes. So I'll talk a bit about, I'll talk a lot about MPI portability and, and, and how to maintain a serial code, a bit about general design and debugging and verification, but please ask questions because this is really just a random thoughts on MPI. So MPI portability. So the classic thing people do is they take, they have an MPI program on their laptop, then they port it to Hector or Archer even, and it stops working and they say, oh, MPI on Archer is broken. And the first thing they've probably done is they've assumed that MPI send is asynchronous. They've done the message around a ring using MPI send and on their laptop, MPI send is implemented with, the, the messages are small enough that on their laptop, they're buffered. So MPI send is implemented as a B send, so they're fine. But on another system, for example, Archer, MPI send might become a sync, might become synchronous send. So, so, so the, the typical thing which MPI send does is for small messages, it will buffer them. For large messages, it won't buffer them. It will, it will, it will become synchronous and, and do a sort of handshaking, in fact. So, but there is a threshold, but it varies. So a correct code should run if you replace all MPI send calls with MPI S send. So the typical mistake people make in all debugging is they have somewhere where the code works correctly, somewhere where the code works incorrectly, and they spend all the time working on the incorrect code. No, you should go back to the correct code and start kicking it a bit to see how you can break it. Because the inc so that's the thing. You, 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 so, for example, in the, in the in the code you think is correct, replace all the sends with s sends. If that code then doesn't work, you've got a bug in your code. Okay. So, so, so this the, the assumption that MPI s send is asynchronous, that MPI s send is implemented as a buffer send, is a similar bug to assuming in C or Fortran that if you do int i integer i, that i will be zero. It might be, you might be lucky, but Fortran and C don't guarantee it. So you should not, so don't, don't say, oh, it works on GCC 3.7.5. You know, this is my other bugbear. I don't care if it works on compiler X or compiler Y. C is a language, GCC, you should program to the language standard. You should know, so that's a, that is the main thing. If you use MPI B sense, which people tend not to do, uh, you have to allocate all the buff you have to allocate all the buffer space yourself. So probably the buffer so if you try to do an MPI B send of a single byte, it will probably fail. Because remember, MPI B send uses if, if you're using explicit B send, it's up to you. It's your responsibility to give MPI the buffer space via this weird MPI buffer attach routine. You might say, how do I know if I want to send a one megabyte message, how do I know how much buffer space it needs? Because it'll need buffer space for the headers. There's some magic number called MPI B send overhead, which you have to add or something. I mean, it's all a bit horrible. You need to look up the standard. But portability is a big issue. And my bugbear is portability seems to be forgotten now because everyone thinks, oh, everything's Linux and GCC. So people, so people develop for years their code in GCC, making all kinds of assumptions which are GCC specific. Then they port their code to another compiler and it doesn't compile and they complain. I'm like, well, that's your fault. You know, you should, you should check portability all the time. Just because something compiles and runs under a particular compiler doesn't mean it's right. There could be bugs in your code which aren't being picked up by chance. There could be features you're using in the compiler which aren't standard that you're not aware of. So. This used to be standard. Every machine had a different compiler. Every machine had a different operating system. But now that Linux and GCC have taken over the world, it seems to have been forgotten. So, so that's very important. Check portability. Check it often as well. I'll come back to that. Data sizes, well, this isn't such of a big issue. People used to ex assume things like they used to assume a float was four bytes. On some machines, that wasn't true. In the old days, on the, the old Cray systems, the float was eight bytes. But the big issue is with, with structs. People, people assume that their struct, their C struct, is, is created in a certain way. They assume that, only, that there's no padding. And maybe you get away with it on a particular compiler. Maybe you're lucky. But 
you really have to be careful. So be careful of compiler dependent padding for structures. MPI type extent is useful to find out the number of bytes that the, 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 the footprint of a data type. MPI type extent is how big it is from start to finish. So if you're, as I said, if you're paranoid, you should, tap the, you should check the MPI type extent of MPI struct is size of struct. Uh, another thing is Fortran programmers often need to know how many bytes are in, uh, in an integer, but Fortran refuses, Fortran refuses to talk about bytes. There is no such thing as a byte in Fortran. However, you can cheat and you can call MPI type extent on MPI integer and get MPI to tell you how big, a, big of an integer is. So if you want to find out the sizes of things in Fortran, I'm sure there's some way of doing it in Fortran 2095 or whatever the current standard is. But um, uh, and that can be useful. Another bugbear of mine is changing precision. So there's two issues here. People often write their code using reals or floats, and then someone says, well, you should be using double precision. And they say, oh, there's this magic compiler flag, minus, minus, promote all variables, that promotes my, my single precision numbers to double precision numbers. That's great, OK? Well, then you write an MPI program, and you're sunk, because all your MPI routines have an explicit MPI send, blah, 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 MPI float. So you need to change all your floats to doubles, OK? So don't rely on, if, you're, if your code is broken, don't rely on magic compiler flags to fix it. Go in and fix it. And what you should do, and the other reason for being able to change precision is very important. The classic get out clause in scientific or technical programming when you get the wrong answer is it's rounding errors. It, it's a catch all. Everyone goes, oh, right, okay. It's like people say, oh, health and safety. We can't have water bottles in here because of health and safety. Why? Oh, uh, I don't know. So people never check. So if you believe, if you're running a double precision calculation and your results vary by one part in 10 to the 5, okay? Is that acceptable or not? I don't know. Everyone just says rounding errors. The only way to check that is to change all the doubles to singles. If the, if the rounding errors get bigger, then yes, it is rounding errors. If they stay the same, you've just got a bug. Okay. So for example, people say, oh, well, what do, you, what do I care? Well, imagine you do a calculation on a thousand by a thousand array. Okay. And you make a mistake in the halo swaps. You forgot, forget to swap the top right hand corner of the array. That's easily done. It's very easy to get things wrong by plus or minus one. Okay. How big is the array? A thousand by a thousand. That's a million elements. You've got one of them wrong. That's a bug of order one part in 10 to the six. So you've got a bug whose effects are of the order of what you claim to be rounding errors. So you need to, you need to, if you know, you need to have some justification. So you, you should be able to change the precision of your code. And you might think you only want to change the precision up, but often it's useful to change the precision down because that proves to you that any errors you're getting are, sorry, any discrepancies are rounding errors and not, not bugs. So the best thing to do is to have some precision.h file. So in C, what you do is you never say float anywhere or double. You have a, your own type called real number, and you do type tf float real number. So everywhere in your code, you just go real number x, real number y. And then the header file is defined through this slightly strange type def syntax that real number means float. Um, for the constants, you just do hash to find MPI real number MPI float. So that's your so for example, in your in your all your all your codes go include precision .h, real number x MPI routine address of x MPI real number. And if you want to re if you want to change precision, you change two edits and you change two lines in one file, and then your make file, which is clever, will pick it up. You do you make, and it will recompile it all in single precision. Now, of course, it might be a bit more complicated than that because you might have other um, you might have other routines. You might be calling specific library routines which have different Dublin precision implementations. But at least for your own code, you can do this. You, should use t you shouldn't do hash to find float real number. No, you shouldn't do hash to find real number float because type def is more than just a textual substitution. I think type def does do, I think type def does proper arg type checking, I think. So for example, Although, although real number is a float, if you have a function that expects a real number and you pass a float, it will say, that's wrong. You passed me a float and I expected a real number. Uh, so, so, so it's probably better. Type def is weird because hash define is hash define new thing, old thing, and type def is type def old thing, new thing. I don't know, someone once explained to me why that was, but I never, I don't understand. In Fortran, it's, it's a bit um, more robust, but probably cleaner. You can have parameterized types as well. So you can do integer parameter. Real number is kind of 1.0 e naught. 
integer parameter mpi real number equals mpi real and then you do real kind equals real number x which says x is a type of the same kind of a single position number and mpi and, and MP, so that's that's the way you can do that. So again, you, a global change of precision is now easy. You use precision because this is in a little module and you, you make two changes and you can recompile your code. So that's, um, these are the design decisions which are quite good. To so this really isn't anything to do with MPI, but it's just that I've seen it as a problem that people who use compiler flags to change precision in their code are sunk when they have an MPI code because they don't have a mechanism for changing the precision in their MPI functions. Testing portability, run on more than one machine, assume the implementations are different. So you might say, well, the departmental cluster is, um, um, well, it's a bit difficult now because Intel again have taken over the world, so everything's Intel. But you might say, well, the departmental cluster is, you know, um, some some new new um, Intel Xeon chip, and my laptop's got some rubbishy old chip. Surely, if my code works on both platforms, it's portable. Well, you're not really talk, talking about portability between hardware here. You're talking about portability between libraries. So it's actually better. It's it's a better test to run your code linked against two different MPI libraries on the same machine than linked against the same MPI library on different machines. And that's quite, so that's quite nice now because you can now develop um, MPI programs on your laptop. If you've got Linux, it's just open MPI. Download MPI CH2 as well, and then you can do both. So, so that'd be a good thing. It, 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 or you develop on your laptop with open MPI and you run on, you develop an Archer which uses a derivative of MPI CH2. It's another implementation of MPI. So again, just because your code runs correctly on one particular library doesn't mean it's right. You might just be lucky. The other thing is if your code crashes on one library, hopefully it also crashes on the other library. Maybe the other library prints a better error message. Maybe the other library says, uh, you know, uh, that rank doesn't look right, or that, you know, so again, it, it, it um, and you need to do this regularly. There's no point developing on your laptop for a year, and the first time it crashes going to Archer, because you'll have hundreds of bugs. It should be a regular testing thing. that you. So, running on two different mid-sized machines may not be a good test. What I mean by that is they're both probably running the same version of MPI. You want to have two different versions. So this is nice. And for, well, this is actually, uh, this slide is relevant to our MSc students, but uh, even with the same MPI implementation, it's, it's worth trying different, um, different compilers. Because when people call an MPI routine and the, and, and the MPI routine crashes, they always think the bug is in the MPI routine. No, 95% of the time, it's because you've passed it an invalid pointer or some, some garbage that the bug is it is, is failing because of, sorry, the, the MPI routine is failing because of some upstream bug. And again, changing compilers and recompiling is a way of, 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 of minimizing that. So serial code, adding MPI can destroy a code. Now this is possibly not particularly obvious with the case study because the case study has been designed so that this, the, the parallel code looks as much as possible like the serial code. But, um, you think you run your MPI code, you say it gets the wrong answer. I've got a bug, it gets the wrong answer. What do you mean by the wrong answer? Well, you mean the wrong answer. Presumably, you thought your serial code was right, so it's different from the serial code. Oh, I don't have a serial code anymore. I've just broken it by putting all this MPI garbage in there. So you'd like to be able to compile and run an identical code without an MPI library. I don't mean running on one process. You run on one process, you're still doing all these sends and receives and stuff like that. Actually recreate a, just a real serial code that you can just run and see what the answer is. And the way you do that is to separate off the communications routine. So in a real production level code, you should not have MPI calls in the main code, okay? For a whole number of reasons, I'll come back to that. You should put all the MPI routines in a separate file and then, and then, so you, and then you, you provide a dummy library for the serial code, and that allows you to to to, um, um, to compile the code in the absence of an MPI library. That means that there is no explicit reference to MPI in your main code. So I'll give you an example. It was in Fortran, um, so but it illustrates the example, the the thing. So, so, and the MPI routines are very verbose, right? You know. 
MPI knit I error, or in C, even worse, MPI knit arg v arg c, MPI com size, com world size error. All you want to do is to start the parallel system, work out who you are and how many there are, okay? So it's much better to encapsulate this in a function, which I, in this code called par begin, size proc ID, all this does is return the size, it initializes MPI, it returns the size and, and my ID, right, proc ID. And so the good thing is if a non-parallel programmer sees that, call par begin, comment, start parallel system, get back who I am and how many, that's obvious what it is. If they see all this garbage, you know, they're just going to get scared away, okay? Also in this code, I just got completely fed up with the fact that ranks began from zero. So it, within the main body of the code, I said, like, th my first rank will be one. So I hid all that away in the library. You know, the library did that for you. And then you say, well, how do I run on the serial machine? You just have a, you just have a, a serial implementation in a different library, which does nothing. Okay? It just does size equals one, proc ID equals one. Or if you're in C, size equals one, proc ID equals zero. And the other classic one is a double sum. Imagine someone who doesn't know about MPI sees this. Um, call MPI all reduced, deval, dtemp, one MPI double precision, that's MPI sum, comma, or deval equals ttemp. I mean, it's just complete rubbish. But what all you want to do is do a parallel sum of a double precision value. So let's have a routine called par d sum of deval, which does it. And A, it hides all this rubbish here, and B, the other problem with all reduce is you're not allowed to, well, unless you specify a funny parameter, you're not allowed to do all reduce in place. The in buff and the out buff have to be different, which is, which is annoying because you don't care what the partial sum is. Remember, we were computing pi. The partial sums were totally meaningless, okay? They would change depending on how many processors you ran on. All you care about is the real sum. So this actually sums up in place. So I use a temporary value, it takes in deval, sums deval to dtemp and swaps them around again. So that means that the, the, the serial code looks a lot nicer, call par d sum, not all this rubbish. And then in the, for the, sorry, your parallel code looks nicer. The serial routine is just nothing. You don't need to do anything, but you need to provide the stub. And if you have a clever make file, so for some reason in this code, I had two communication routines, dem parallel and dem comms. I can't remember why I split them. And I had, so, all my main source code had no calls to MPI in it, none whatsoever. It called routines like par d sum, par begin. If I link into this MPI source, I get the real re real versions. But if I have a, ver a fake source, dem fake par and dem fake comms, these were the fake versions. And you need to make one, if you have a clever make file, you need to make one change. You say the parallel source is either the fake source or the MPI source. So. This is maybe not obvious if you've not done make, but, but, but you, know, you can arrange it so that with a trivial you know, two-character change, you can recompile a serial version. Now, what are the advantages? You can compile the serial program from the same source, which makes the parallel code more, more, more um, readable. I haven't actually set that here. OK, so it enables code to be ported to other libraries. So for example, Imagine someone told you, ah, on this machine, there's this wacky routine for doing global sums. It's really quick, okay? Rather than having to go away and change your main code, all you do is change this one routine here, and instead of call MPI or reduce, you call wacky really fast or reduce. But that's all hidden away. You, you don't see that. And, uh, okay, that's... And the library can be optimized for different MPI. So what you ought to, the problem with the way people program an MPI is they just stick MPI in everywhere and all these random calls. You shouldn't be thinking about writing an MPI program. You should be thinking about writing a message passing program. So you should say, what do I need to do in this code? I need to initialize the message passing system. I need to do global sums. I need to do halo swaps. You need three routines. Initialize parallel system, global sum, and halo swap. So you just have a routine called call halo swap, OK? That's all you see. Then you can implement that how you like. So you might say, what's the fastest way of doing a halo swap? S send, B send, send, receive, I send. You could just implement all those versions in the library. It's still called halo swap. And when you first go to a new machine, try them out and pick the fastest one. Okay. So it's, it's an incredibly, and also it makes you think properly. It makes you think, I'm writing a message passing program, and I happen to be implementing an MPI. The most mistake people make is they start slamming vast amounts of MPI code in their, in their 
in their main code, they start getting the wrong answer. They don't have the original code. They just completely lost. So that so so separating new communications off into communications library. Now this used to be essential because in the old days, 15 years ago, you couldn't well 20 years ago you couldn't guarantee that you had MPI. So every machine had its own communications libraries. This was standard 20 years ago. Everyone had their own communications libraries and they had to re-implement them, which was just a few days work every time you went to a new machine. This has sort of been forgotten because people think, well, MPI is everywhere. No, it's still a useful, it's still a, a, a much better way of, of programming because MPI is so verbose, okay? I mean, it really is. So again, general design issues, separate communication to come into a library. And this is a kind of a, a meaningless statement, but make the parallel code as simple as possible to the serial. Now the problem is, if someone gives you a serial code and says, parallelize this in MPI, that is a very hard job. Because they may have taken design decisions very early on in the code that made that difficult. However, if you're writing a parallel code from scratch, you can make design decisions that make um, the code, the serial and the parallel code look very similar. So for example, use of halos in the case study. There's no reason in the case study, if you wrote it in serial, not just have special code. At the, if I'm on the top line, then do this. If I treat the pixels on the edge specially, have a special routine for updating the boundary about boundary pixels because of this funny two five, uh, you know, the, the fact that they're surrounded by, by two five fives. But if you say no, in the serial code, I will have explicit halos, which are filled with 255s explicitly, rather than having different update rules for the, for the pixels on the edge. Then that turns out that the serial code and the parallel code are almost identical. And for example, if you put your the code, which is do i equals 1 to n, do i equals 1 to m, old ij is new is old plus old plus old plus old minus edge or whatever the update routine is. If you put that in a function call, the serial code says update new old mn and the parallel code uses the same routine. You don't even need to recompile it. All it does is says update new old, but you're operating on a smaller array. So, you know, there you're not just using the same code. You, don't, you wouldn't even need to recompile the update routine. It's the same routine, it's just that you call it on a smaller array. So again, that's another... Uh, kind of design aim is to try and make your parallel code as, as, as readable as possible. This may have a large impact on the design of your serial code. You might have to say, right, I'm going to have to use halos in my serial code, even if I didn't think that was very natural. And if, but the, the most difficult thing to do is someone gives you a big serial code and says parallelize it. To be honest, in MPI, that is almost impossible. What you do is you, you have to blow the code apart and about a year later, all the pieces fall back together again and you hope it still works. So. It is difficult. Don't try and be too clever. Okay, I've seen people codes where there's a literative loop for 10,000 iterations and every iteration they swap the halos. But on the last iteration, they've gone, ah, ah, you don't need to swap the halos on the last iteration because it's the last iteration. So they say, if it's the last iteration, don't swap the halos. Saving themselves a microsecond or some trivial amount of time. I mean, six months later, you come back to the code, and now you think, oh, well, after the code's finished, I need to do this calculation. And you assume the halos are up to date. And they're not. They're an iteration out of date, and you get the wrong answer. Don't try and be clever. Just, you know, just write simple code. Later on, you can put, you know, hash if def clever in there or something. But don't try and be clever from the start. Just write code that works. So don't agonize over small details. The other thing is computer editing everywhere. I mean, I, I think Nick mentioned this, but again, you might say, okay, I need to compute the, um, the global rainfall across the UK. And uh, I'm only gonna print it to the screen, so I'll just use reduce, because only the master needs to know it, the global rainfall. So you do a call reduce uh, rainfall, and you print the rainfall is this, okay. The problem is that every process has a variable called rainfall, okay? It turns out because of the way you've written the code, it only has a, a legitimate value on the master because you used reduce, but it exists everywhere. So six months later, you come back and say, all oh, right, now I've got this new rainfall subroutine, Right, I need to do different things depending on what the rainfall is. Oh, there's that variable rainfall. Oh, look at this value, it's printed out, that's fine. You forget that rainfall was actually only correctly defined on the route because you tried to be clever and say, oh, I can save a microsecond by not doing an all reduce, okay? So don't do those things. Try and use all reduce. 
using all reduce makes things simpler. It means, for example, that the variables, the reduction variables are always, the problem with SPMD programming is the variables exist on every process, whether they, are, whether they make sense or not. So, so, so make them make sense everywhere, and then you won't get into these problems. The other thing is make p a compile time constant. So you'll, you'll have seen that the, the, the defining feature of the case study example is that in the parallel code, the arrays are smaller. They're not m by n, they're m over p by n, or m by n over p, okay? So that means that if you want, if you want to have a code that runs, if you want to have a single executable that runs on multiple numbers of processes, you will have to do some kind of dynamic array allocation, runtime array allocation, because the array dimensions, even for the same problem size, depend on the processor count. Now in Fortran, this isn't too bad, because you have allocate. In C, you can have these inline, you know, you can just do real X, but that, that tends to blow the memory pretty quickly because of the way it's allocated. So, so C programmers start resorting to malloc. C programmers love malloc. Um, uh, and then, or hell breaks loose, because, I mean, unless you understand what you're doing, mallocing double two-dimensional arrays is just a pain in the whatever. So you should never write a code that only runs on four processes, right? But there's nothing wrong with writing a code that only runs on p processes, where p is a compile time constant. Yes, it means you have to recompile the code when you run on different numbers of processes, but that's not a big deal. It might be simpler to do that than spend two months trying to work out how malloc works with multidimensional arrays. Well, that's not that difficult, but I mean, it's just pretty horrible. So you may think it's not very elegant, but it can make coding much easier, ED definition of array bounds. So if you put the, 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 the definition in include file, hash define, you know, P8 or something, uh, when you change that, then your code will recompile. You do a make and the make file notices it. So I have seen people jump through hoops to write complicated code just so that their code ran on every number of processes. So the same execute, and just, you know, keep it simple. And often you think, don't have to recompile the whole code. No, you don't. Because if you pass your arrays around as, if you do your calculation, and you only need to change the pieces of code where the arrays are defined, not where they're processed. Because if you pass the array dimensions in the argument list, which again is a bit difficult in C, but you can do it, um, then you may only have to recompile a, a fraction of the routines. But, and compilation isn't that slow nowadays. Um, so again, you know, some people, just for the sake of wanting to have the same executable run on any number of processes, end up with incredibly complicated. Again, nowadays in Fortran, it's probably not an issue because allocate is so easy. But in C, it is a bit of a, a pain. Debugging, parallel debugging can be hard. The first thing is don't assume it's a parallel bug. I've seen people spend months, well, weeks, try and find a, a bug because they just assume it crashed on 128 processes. There's some complicated parallel bug and it was just a bug bug. They were reading in the wrong file. They hadn't initialized the variable. So if you, if, if you find, if your code crashes on a thousand processes, as I said, don't debug the code that crashes. Go back to the code that works. Run up the serial code first. Run the parallel code with p equals 1. If you have a bug in the way you're calling your MPI, it may show up here. Run on a small number of processes. It's very, it's not unknown, but it's, most bugs, if they are parallel bugs or, or think, thinking bugs, logic bugs, will show up on 4, 8, 12 processes. So just because your code crashes on 1,024, find the minimal number of code on which it processes on which it crashes. Debug that one. Don't try and debug the massive code. Uh, you can have problems that the output's very difficult to, um, to interpret because you have this huge log file with output from all the processes in it. So it can be nice to, to write to separate log files. If you get, for, if you get processes at zero writing to log zero, zero, process one to log zero, one. And you can do that quite easily. So for example, in C, instead of using printf, you could use fprintf to a file, and by default, the file could be standard out, but then it allows you quickly to flip that to be a, a process-dependent file. And in Fortran, you can do it as well. You'd have a unit, which by default was unit 6, or standard out. Um, 
I don't think Forshan defines that six is standard out, but it always is. Uh, or you could flip that to be a file. I said some parallel debuggers exist, but it, learning a debugger is as more effort than learning a new language. I mean, they're very complicated tools. Yes, if you're going to be developing parallel codes day in, day out for a long time, then you should learn a parallel debugger. But I think that my approach to debugging is more of an experimental approach. The code crashed on 1024. Does it crash on one? Does it crash on two? Does it crash on six? Does it crash with bigger arrays? Does it crash with smaller arrays? That gives you, it's like kicking the tires of the, and then you find, you get some feeling for what's going on. I mean, debuggers aren't magic. If you're really, really lucky, the debugger will say, process three crashed at line 57 and X was equal to minus five, okay? It's up to you to work out why that is. So, I mean, I, if it's somebody else's code, yes, you have to use a debugger. But if it's your own code and you understand it, I, I, I think, you know, pragmatic test, testing the code um, will, is a better way of doing it. Though I may be, I may be old-fashioned and wrong there. So, okay, this is my big thing. People write programs deliberately to make them impossible to debug. So the classic one is the silent program. So you do ap run minus np6 program.exe seg v core dumped, okay? Someone says, my code didn't work. You say, where did this crash? Did it run for one second? Did it run for one hour? And if you've run it in a batch system, it may not be obvious, right? I don't understand there is a tent why people don't write to the screen. I, I, I cannot understand it. You spent your life writing this program. At least make it say hello, star. I mean, literally, this could have crashed after a millisecond, right? You might have declared an array which was too big on the first line of your program. And if you don't, so, so you know, even printing hello as the first line of your program is a debugging, a, a deep, is a, it's an absolute boon to debugging because it tells you, did my program even start, okay? It's not even clear if, maybe this is, a, maybe this is a, an error message from MP run, yeah? So you really, you know, yeah. Why, I do not understand why people don't write to the screen. So this is the kind of thing a program should do. It should say program running, say how many processes you're running on, yeah? Because, you know, Maybe this isn't the syntax. Maybe, this, maybe it should be minus n, okay? So just say how you're running on. Whenever you do file I.O., say I'm reading it, but always say I'm done. Because reading input file crash isn't any use because you don't know if it crashed while reading the input file or seven hours later. If you've got a critical parallel operation that you're concerned about, you know, print. If you have variables you're concerned about, print them, but print the rank. Because x equals 3 is meaningless. You have to say who you're on. And then, what, if you're running for 10,000 iterations, this is the other thing I don't understand. I say, your program's not printing anything. Oh, yeah, it's in a bigger sort of loop. Well, yeah, okay, but, you know, print out every 100 or 1,000. Don't print out every iteration, okay? Then you're going to... But just every 100 or 1,000 iterations, just print, you know, just so you know it's still running. So that means if your program gets killed by the, um, by the batch system, Right? You'll say, ah, it did 900 out of 1,000 iterations. I just need to add an hour to my... But if it just dies, you think, well, you don't know... I don't know how long my program took. So, and then write... So just, you know, get into the habit of write... Don't, not writing regional output to the screen. And then what people do is they say, oh, they write numbers to the screen. So they do this... They, they run it, and you get 1, 3, 5, 6, 3, 9, 8, 3.7. You're like that. Because okay. they've written this. I actually timed myself, and five seconds is conservative. It takes less than five seconds to convert those meaningless print statements into meaningful ones, where you actually say what the rank is. Because basically, you'll come back two years later, and you'll see three, nine, minus five, and you're like, okay. I don't know. But if it said rank three, j is nine, and x is minus five, you're, oh, wait a second, x has to be positive. There's my bug. Or rank three, j is minus seven. But I do not understand why people just print raw numbers to the screen. It, it's, it's a, I don't know where it comes from, but it's a, this will save you hours of debugging time. Print, due to the odd proper print statement with text in it, will save you hours and hours and hours of debugging time because you'll say immediately, oh, X can't be minus 8.37. Okay. So debugging, so this is the classic thing, debugging walkthrough, this is new. My case study code gives the wrong answer. So this is what the case study code does. It reads data in, it distributes it to processes, it updates many times with halo swaps, it collects the data and it writes the data out. But the final stage shows the error. 
you got the wrong answer. But where did it go wrong? Well, you can debug that in, um, you can debug that by read the data and write it out. And so the output should be the same as the input. Distribute to processes, how do you know that's worked? Well, maybe get each process to write its data out to a file. And you'll get lots of little files, which are the sub-images. Update many times. Well, how about updating zero times or update one time? Or, you know, the halo swaps are going wrong. Well, run the code with the halo swaps commented out. See if that's the point. Collect the data back, right? So, so you know, gradually, um, just because just because you discovered the error here doesn't mean the error was here. The error could have been way up here. The classic problem is that people get the wrong answer because they never read the right data in. So, you know, just, just try and, you know, it's called computational science. We're supposed to be doing science. Where, you know, where is the evidence for the fact that, that the code crashed here? You know, put in stuff which allows you to do that. So the final stage always shows the error, but where did it first go wrong? People always assume that if it crashes here, this is where the bug is. No, 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 the bug could have been way up here, yeah, and just shown its, its, its ugly face down here. Bugs are often further upstream than you think they are. So common mistake, I changed something and now it works, but I don't know why. All is okay. So I had a bug and then I put a print statement in and it went away. Oh, great. That's brilliant. I'll carry on. Okay. No, 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 no. You're, you know, we had a, one of our best ever MSc students didn't get the top mark because in about the first month of his project, he had a bug and he didn't really understand it, but it kind of went away. So he was, oh, that's okay. Then when he's coming up to write his dissertation, He's running on Archer, on Hector it was, on Thousand, and then it starts to break and it fall apart. It's the same bug come back to bite him, but because he didn't fix it, it and then he, he passed, but he didn't get the best mark because he'd ignored a bug. There's a bug, you must find it. Just because it goes away doesn't mean it's gone. So this is the classic, put a print statement and it goes away. Well, his one was one, you know, his, well, it, it, it crashed under Cray Fortran, but it compiled under GCC, so I switched to GCC. No, no, that's not a good thing. Yeah, the bug's still there, and it's going to come back to bite you. You must find it. It will come to back to bite you. So as I said, I think of debugging as an experimental science. You, you do experiments on your code and get results, which allows you to build up some feeling for, for how, how good you... All codes have bugs, right? Your code is never correct, but you just have to, you just have to, you have, to have evidence that your code works satisfactorily. So, as I said, I'm running a bit late, but this is going back to the, um, the um, case study example. Did it go wrong on input? Did it go on distribute? Did it go wrong on update? And, and the classic one, for example, is um, if you've got a two-dimensional decomposition, okay? So, so imagine you were doing the case study decomposed over a grid of processes, and it goes wrong, okay? Well, you've got two stages there. You're swapping halos up, down, and left, right, okay? So you can, de you can experimentally debug them def differently, run it on a 2x2 two two decomposition, a 4x1 decomposition, and a 1x4 decomposition. In the 4x1, you don't have to swap the, the Y halos, and the 1x4, you don't have to swap the X halos. So you, know, you, don't have to, you don't have to edit your code to debug it. You can just try it in different situations. And often you'll find, well, wait a second, it worked for 4x1, but not by 1x4. That means the Y halo swaps are, are to blame. So you fix that, and then the code works. The final one is a question, uh, yeah, is my code working? This is very difficult because should the output be identical for any P, it is, where P is the number of processes, it's very hard to have a program which gives identical results for different values of P. You'd even see, just calculating pi, okay? That was hard. So in practice, you have to accept that your code will give different values on different numbers of processors. Whether that's accept, so you need to have some definition acceptable. People get very upset about this, okay? And they, they, they think this is a parallelization issue. It's not a parallelization issue. For example, oh, I have to do some code here. Their serial code went for i equals naught, i less than n, the whites and capitals. Right, fine. That was their serial code, yeah? I equals not I listen there. Sub equals some plus A of I. Then they get really upset that in the parallel code, 
where, where the loop isn't from 1 to n, it's maybe split up into sections and then recombined, they get a different answer, okay? Oh, the world's broken. It's terrible. It isn't the end of the world. But God didn't say you had to do it that way, yeah? If you'd done this, you'd have got a different answer in the first place, right? The first answer wasn't right. It was just as wrong as, I mean, the, you know, people get, get, they're obsessed they've got the right answer, and if it changes, they think it's the wrong answer. No, your, your first answer wasn't right. This is just as right, yeah? You don't have to, so this would have given a different answer. So you have to be pragmatic that you have to say, you know, is my code giving acceptably right answers? However, um, how about the same code for fixed p? We saw that if you use MPI any source for the receive, even as a code as simple as the pi example, the same executable run on the same number of processes can give different answers. That is not acceptable because that code is impossible to debug. So the out identical output for two runs on the same number of processes, this should be achievable with a little care. This is very hard to achieve. The people who do weather modeling require this, and they spend their lives jumping through hoops to achieve it for things for reasons I don't quite understand. Um, but, I mean, I'm not... What they say is, if I run my parallel code on four processes, it predicts exactly the same weather as if I run it on eight. Yeah, but it's a chaotic system, so it doesn't matter. You didn't know what the weather was anyway. So I don't know why... So I don't really understand their obsession with it. Uh, but the same... If you run the same code, you have to, okay? So this, I realize now, is not true. I spoke to Dan. There always used to be a, an ambiguity as to whether you called all reduced twice on the same input data. Was it guaranteed to give the same answer? Because, for example, you can imagine the runtime library saying the first time doing it with algorithm A, and the second time saying, oh, there's a bit of network congestion, I'll do a different algorithm, which would give you a slightly different answer. That would be a nightmare, actually. So I think MPI, I need to check this up. I'll have a comp. That, that, oh, that's down over there. Sorry. Okay, I don't have time now, but I'll, I'll, if you can show me the point in the standard, I'll point out to people. It's quite an important point that I was at Willie out of here. So again, the final thing is some parallelization approaches may be simple, but not necessarily optimal for performance. So the case study example is, 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 a, is a good example, saying, look, should I decompose the picture into slabs or into blocks? It will be infinitely harder to write the code, or very harder to write the code, um, if, you do, if you do blocks. Yeah, in, 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 but it's much easier if you do it into slabs because of a whole number of simplifications. You need to under uh, so you need to understand if you're never going to run this code on more than ten processes, then probably slabs are fine. You need to think some parallel approaches are very complicated. Sometimes you should just think of a simpler approach. The main thing is people write incredibly complicated code, and you should just if if your code gets complicated in scientific and technical programming, not in gen but for for scientific and technical calculations, it's very rare that the message passing really needs to be that complicated. If it starts to get complicated, you should think, wait a second, I've, maybe I've made a, a mistake here. Maybe there's a collective routine that would do this for me. Maybe I should say, right, I'm going to do it a more simple way. Optimization, keep running your code on a number of input data to the range of MPI processes. The mistake people make is my code runs slowly. It must, it must be the parallel part. Maybe your code is just a slow code. So you should distinguish between performance and scaling. If your code doesn't scale well, i.e. you do the double number of processes and it doesn't go any faster, that you should find out what the parallel routines are the bottlenecks. And again, this is much easier with a separate comms library. If you've funneled all your communications through a few library routines, your own, you can just put timers around them easily. But if the performance is poor, you should work on the serial code, okay? Don't assume just because your code runs slow that that's the parallel problem. You might just have an inefficient um, algorithm. So my conclusion is run on a variety of machines. So now it's great. You should be able to debug codes on small numbers of processes on your laptop and then run them on a large supercomputer. And that's great for maintaining portability. Keep it simple. Maintain the serial version. Don't assume all bugs are parallel bugs. This is the, the number one thing and then find a debugger again this a linear ddt is seems to be is pretty common now and it's um so that you know that is pretty good a linear ddt they're actually a british company which is quite amazing um but it is commercial so it's up to you whether you buy it or not okay so there's my last 
So sorry, I had to run through that bit at the end. Are there, are there any questions? I know it's coming up to lunch, but I'm happy to talk about it. Is there any quick people wanted to ask? So, so, so Dan's pointing me a point, once, page 175. So today's reading will be from page 175. Uh, oh, it is strongly recommended. Ah, it is strongly recommended that MPI reduce be implemented so that the same result may be obtained whenever the function is applied on the same arguments appearing in the same order. Note that this may prevent optimizations that take advantage of the physical location of ranks. What they're saying is there, if, if two MPI processes are on the same physical node, you could add them up through shared memory. And that might not, or you might not even order them. Um, so if, if the MPI library has, I've seen MPI libraries where there was an environment there where you could say, make sure all reductions were reproducible. And then you could maybe turn that off. I might go a bit faster if I turn them off. So, so it's not a requirement, but it is a strong recommendation. 